I think, I mean, I feel completely shocked that states like uh, Georgia or Moldova, even after they've seen what happens to Ukraine and what has happened to Ukraine, would still want to uh, try and join NATO. It's in America's national interest to weaken Russia. They say it in document after document. It is in their interest to have uh, to keep China down. And for that, they need these. And so America is actually a parasitic power. It uses these states for its own agenda. Look, we're not part of NATO. Have ha, have we suffered? Uh, we, we don't want to be part of NATO. We, we uh, want to be neutral. We want to ex- be able to exercise strategic autonomy. And with this, it helps development. I must tell the Georgians this, that when a country needs development, when it needs stability, it should not over-securitize. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have the great pleasure of talking again to an academic from India, a colleague of mine, Professor Anuradha Chenoy. She's a specialist of international affairs who has worked for decades, especially on Russia, human security, arms trade and peace building. Uh, Anu is was very nice to agree to give me a briefing about what's happening in Bangladesh and Pakistan. And we uh, are going to try to connect the dots with what um, what has been happening in Ukraine and Georgia, because these cases are not the same, but they're very similar. And especially in regard to the upcoming elections in Georgia in October, we want to see what we can expect from learning from um, basically the South, South Asian case. Uh, Anu, thank you very much for coming online today. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I love your show. And uh, thank you for calling me. Yes. Thank you. It's very nice because, you know, I, I am not aware of what ha- what's happening or what the dynamics are that led to this recent putsch, you have to call it, uh, in Bangladesh, where the, um, the democratically elected prime minister uh, was was ousted and is now replaced by somebody who, by many commentators, is perceived as a very American-friendly person. Uh, one and a half years ago, we had the ouster of Imra Khan in Pakistan. Um, And it is now, I mean, certain cables have leaked, which have shown that this was very much at least encouraged (laughs) by the US side, because Imran Khan was actually trying to uh, use something or to to have a foreign policy, which uh, the American undersecretary, one of the undersecretaries of state called aggressive neutrality. They were not they were not putting sanctions on Russia after the um, after 2022. Um, and you are in India, you're in New Delhi, you've studied international relations. And could you tell me what what exactly is happening in South Asia? Yeah, I want to put uh, first two broad paradigms before uh, we get on to uh, these cases. One is that um, the U.S. very clearly fuses itself on any conflict in the world and, uh, we, and you know, manipulates it to suit itself, which is often regime change or intervention. And uh, that's what it is doing in Asia. So uh, if there's any latent conflict, if there's a dissent movement, uh, they take use that as an opportunity uh, where they nurture uh, different sides of the opposition um, and uh, build a, a narrative. Uh, and then um, uh, they, they're very often very successful in this kind of regime change, doesn't, which, doesn't, which has local roots as well. That's one. Secondly, in, in South Asia, the last couple of years, two or three years, it's been like a polycrisis, a multi-crisis, because you can see the number of regimes which have changed and fallen. Sri Lanka. Right, I forgot re- that one. Sri Lanka as well, yeah. Yeah, that that regime changed. Um, there was that huge kind of popular revolution where the Rajapaksas were, the president um, and his brother were, and his family were thrown out. Uh, then uh, in Pakistan, um, then Bangladesh, uh, in Nepal several times, uh, 
uh, in the Maldives, uh, one government failed and uh, fell, another one came, then there were elections again. Of course, in India, there wasn't uh, that kind of uh, intervention, but we had our normal uh, elections. But over a, about seven or eight governments changed in the course of the last two years. Uh, and out of these, um, uh, there was quite a bit of U.S. intervention. So um, very quickly about, should we just very quickly talk about Pakistan first before we get on to Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. uh, now, in both Pakistan and uh, Pakistan doesn't have a very deep culture of uh, political culture of uh, democracy. As you know, it's been under army rule for so many years. Uh, but the last few years, the army seemed to have stepped back and uh, the civilian space and the political parties have had more say. That's one thing. But the army always takes in charge of foreign policy. So they haven't given up the role they play in, in foreign policy and in intervening in institutions. And the army has also always had a history of um, being very closely linked to the US. The US needs Pakistan for a number of things. One is to intervene in Afghanistan, with which Pakistan has a border, in Central Asia. Again, Pakistan is a neighboring country of what stands between India and Central Asia, for example, is Pakistan. And Pakistan has a fairly close relation with China, which uh, initially, when there was a Soviet-Chinese uh, uh, rift, um, and you know, uh, at that time, uh, the the U.S. was quite comfortable with uh, Pakistan getting close to China. But of late, they have not. But they can do very little about it because Pakistan is deeply in debt. So the U.S. has great interest in controlling which way Pakistan's foreign policy uh, actually goes in the region. Um, the other thing is that internally. Pakistan is quite unstable and polarized because of the different provinces and different ethnic communities. Sindh, the, uh, that's near, in, near Karachi, the capital, Punjab, which is next to India, which is the biggest and very most influential province, the Baluch, where there's a lot of problem these days, you're seeing terror attacks, and there's a secessionist movement. Uh, the Northwest uh, frontier provinces and and so on. So it's a it's not a difficult pay, place for uh, intervent external intervention because they can play these identity conflicts against each other. Now when Imran Khan was a very he's a very popular figure and the fact is that the earlier um, prime minister and the opposition the the pe Bhutto's and Benazir Bhutto's popular, you know, PPP Pakistan party uh, and her son, who is a leader, um, they are at loggerheads with uh, Imran, obviously, because they wanted to be in, in power. But Imran became uh, prime minister and Imran tried to shift the foreign policy of Pakistan for the first time in its history. And that is moving away from the U.S. to uh, actually getting better relations with Russia, uh, make, giving a hand of, you know, maybe having some kind of detente with India and continuing to take a lot of loans uh, from China and that BRI, which... Uh, connects um, to the Gwadar port uh, in in Pakistan. Uh, so um, the day after Imran went to actually meet President Putin, it was around February 
2022 when the Ukraine war was just about starting, but this was a meeting which had been fixed earlier. Uh, this movement uh, kind of, at the one hand, some kind of a bit of a popular movement against, uh, against Imran, led by the opposition also began at one side, but it was not very strong. But uh, the army started making all kinds of allegations and cases against Imran. Many of them, in a, in a period of time, you know, the courts in South Asia move very slowly, very slowly. It's almost like justice delayed, justice denied. They moved against uh, Imran and uh, they decided to imprison him. So there was a, a regime change and then uh, elections and uh, Imran's uh, party leaders and he himself were in jail when these elections happened. The court in Pakistan is quite famous for um, uh, agreeing to what the army needs. I was about to ask, is the court controlled by one of the, or is the court under under close control of one of the political parties or under close control by the military establishment? I think it's a mixture uh, where the military also has, uh, has a role because uh, the courts and a lot of the elite believe that the Pakistan military is essential for the existence of the Pakistan state. Mm. That if they get weakened, uh, India, for example, would have an advantage. And uh, on the other side, uh, they have this problem now with the Taliban and Afghanistan. The border is not, uh, you know, properly demarcated. Uh, they, they'd had a small uh, skirmish with Iran at one point. Um, and there are a lot of internal, uh, there are some secession movements. So the, the army always is, is an important player in, in Pakistan. So, um, and the opposition, while it was discredited and Nawaz Sharif, the former prime minister, was in jail uh, earlier and then in, in exile, um, he was brought back and his brother won the election and they have a coalition government and Imran continues to be in jail. So there, uh, Imran Khan very clearly said even before uh, that uh, the US is intervening in uh, Pakistan, they, he showed a letter that he had from the U.S. and uh, the U.S. consulate plays a role like a viceroy still in, in these smaller states. And, um, uh, and that's what, that was it. And that was a regime change. And he continues to stay in, uh, in, in jail. His party has been fragmented and scattered. He's still popular, though recently, a few months ago, uh, not a few months, just when the Bangladesh uh, movement uh, was happening, the students in Pakistan said that we're going to start a movement again for the release of uh, Imran, that the elections were rigged. So there is this political instability. Pakistan has taken a loan from the World Bank and IMF the 23rd time. So they are in deep debt. There is a severe economic crisis. There's an energy crisis, which Imran was trying to solve by getting Russian uh, oil and gas, which the US and army did not allow. And so it was a case of, I think, very direct intervention by uh, the US empire. And the I suppose this debt is, of course, denominated in US dollars. Uh, what else? And the the it then the, there's this huge parallel to Bangladesh, which recently had its regime change. Now in in Pakistan, the U.S. has also does the U the U.S. has bases there, right? Um, the U.S. had one uh, had one base, and they have a lot of agreements which allow them to um, take their army to uh, air force to take off from there. And uh, their whole operation in the uh, in Afghanistan had a lot of uh, support in that in that region. Yeah, they needed it... Pakistan for uh, Afghanistan earlier, you know, uh, and a, a lot of uh, the Afghan refugees were in um, in Pakistan. In fact, the entire Mujahid, the Taliban, were nurtured there. Uh, 
yeah. in the eight, 80s so when uh, the soviet union was overthrown there so the us operations were held from there osama bin laden was ultimately found there and the us found him there and they came in took him and took him out without pakistan even knowing yeah he That's was he was he was he was shot on pakistani territory he was hiding in pakistan and yes. the, 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 there was a this this talk and i think we have no uh, conclusive evidence uh, or no co no conclusions about this so far but there are a lot of people who are saying look uh, osama bin laden couldn't have been hiding in pakistan without the tacit consent of the of the pakistani military this is that's what yes that's what because it is a military base where he was i've been so, so i've been to that region it's a complete military base it it's like the old cantonments as they call it here but this would this would signal that okay the pakistani military on the one hand is is playing ball with the united states but only to a certain extent i mean yes. also they're 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 not controlled by the us the way the ukrainian government and military yeah. are controlled no. directly by the us right no because they they have a lot of experience in handling the us china the internal issues so it's a political military um and um you know, they, they they probably had a hand in the assassination of uh, Benazir Bhutto. But, you know, these things have to be proved and they it's not difficult. It's quite difficult to say, make a final point on it. But everyone knows the military is powerful and that the U.S. does continue to have a say in, in Pakistani politics. Sure. But that, in that case, the U.S. not having a, an extensive network of bases in Pakistan might not just be because they don't want to, but maybe because the Pakistani military actually doesn't let that happen. Uh, because if you look at what's happening now in Finland and Sweden, where these two uh, uh, states signed up to NATO, and now they get 15, 17 air like bases, US military bases, the US loves putting its people, its troops on foreign soil, because for them, the world is a, is a, is a, is a game of risk, where you need to have your pieces in as many places as possible. And when it comes to Bangladesh, the talk is that the US wants an, a naval base at uh, to con to control the Gulf of Bengal. Um, do you think that is likely to happen if we now switch to Bangladesh? Yes. Okay. In in Bangladesh again, uh, you know, um, there's a it's linked to the history of Bangladesh uh, itself. Uh, Bangladesh got was part of Pakistan. It was East Pakistan, uh, so its identity initially was very uh, Pakistan was Pakistani, but it is the Bengali section, and it, it and there's no link between. It was, there was no link between East Pakistan and West Pakistan because there are two sides of India. And the East Pakistan is very Bengali, Bengali Muslim, primarily with, with a Hindu and small Christian minority. Uh, and it was the neglected area of Pakistan always. And so therefore this movement started, that, that national liberation movement for secessionist movement, uh, where there was a lot of oppression. I mean... A million people were killed. Hundreds of thousands of women were raped with, uh, by the Pakistani army uh, during this Bangladesh liberation in uh, 19, from 69, 70, etc. And then India intervened and supported the Bangladesh liberation movement of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And um, that's how it became a success. Of course, that huge movement was a local movement, but ultimately, because there were hundreds of thousands of refugees coming into India for years because of this op Pakistani oppression, there were reasons and India just couldn't take it anymore. And they intervened militarily. There was a war between India and Pakistan. And at that stage, the US completely supported Pakistan. They sent their seventh fleet into the Indian Ocean. Uh, they threatened, they, it was Prime Minister Indira Gandhi at that time, they threatened her uh, with consequences, but she was a very tough president and a pr prime minister. And she had a close relation with the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, so there was 1972, 73, one. one. Yeah, at that time, yeah. And uh, it was a success. Uh, the Pakistan regime fell, they had to leave, Bangladesh became independent, and the leader of the movement, 
of the Awami League, which was a ruling party until recently, uh, because his daughter then took over after uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was assassinated, because the politics of Bangladesh again has uh, three or four factions, which we need to understand a, at least a little bit of. One is those who are have the heritage, the legacy of the national movement, and that is the Awami League. And though Sheikh um, Majibur Rahman was assassinated, and uh, then the army again took over for a while, and there's another, or the opposition party, which is, which is more pro-Pakistan, Islamist party, that is the BNP, uh, with, um, uh, you know, related to the opposition, uh, 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 to the opposition and to the Islamist kind of factions. Uh, and her name, again, the widow of um, one of the earlier uh, generals, was uh, Begum Khaled Azia of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. She's in opposition to the Awami League. And there is the Jamaat, the proper Islamist grouping. Uh, now, the last, uh, Sheikh Begum Hasina the, of the Awami League, who identifies with the uh, liberation movement, the Awami League, they, she has been in power for almost 24 years. She's won three elections. Of course, the opposition says these elections were very rigged. And because she's also been in power for so long, there was, I think, a dual kind of um, assessment that one can make. On the one hand, this has been a good period for Bangladesh, which was one of the poorest countries earlier, unstable, because in between they had army rule, etc. But the last 24 years um, or, 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 or so, uh, they've had the highest growth rate in South Asia. The women, there's the highest growth rate of women in uh, formal and informal labor. Uh, there has been a political stability. Their social indicators have been bet the best in South Asia. So there has been kind of aspirations and the rise of a new class also. And a lot of people have been lifted out of poverty. But at the same time, um, this lady, the Prime Minister, Hasina, she had become very autocratic and kind of lost touch with the people and their aspirations. She had curbed dissent, and that is a major issue of why people want freedom world over, and, and the leadership, especially in Asia, doesn't understand it. Uh, she imprisoned uh, the opposition, uh, Begum Khalida had, uh, she got a sentence uh, to be for corruption, um, to be imprisoned for 18 years. She had lots of cases against her. And the opposition boycotted the last election. So, so there was like in Bangladesh, like any other country, has different factions of political visions and political groupings. And they have infighting, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the the ruling party has been using uh, quite uh, um, militarized and 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 draconic tactics in order to stay in power. And the unrest on the ground is not un is understandable. It's understandable that a large part uh, portion of the of the population are unhappy with this kind of rule. Uh, that is what you're saying, right? That's right. Mm. But at the same time. Um... The, this Prime Minister Hasina, she also had, she's been in her foreign policy, because that's what concerns us, is that she's been very close to India. Mm. India has been kind of um, helping and giving a lot of development assistance, soft loans, and she's also close to China. So China has its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it has a link through Bangladesh. Uh, and she balances between India and China. Uh, and she's kept the Americans out, basically. So uh, during the Ukraine war, for example, Bangladesh's official policy was of a very clear neutrality. 
It's there in their statements that they are going to be neutral, that they do not want to be part of uh, either side. One. Second, Russia has been uh, building some nuclear power plants which Bangladesh really needed for electricity. Uh, the, and I saw this directly because there was a, a statement by the Americans saying you cannot continue with those power plants. And both Bangladesh and Russia has invested uh, maybe millions of dollars worth in those power plants already. They are you know, almost ready for uh, operation. And the ships from Russia came I think there were about eight ships with material and uh, for the power plant. And uh, the uh, Americans said that if they enter Bangladesh, we will put draconian sanctions. So the ships had to return. They had to turn back. Uh, I heard this because India allowed those ships to dock in one of our ports on their return because they were stranded. So this is how the U.S. started intervening. Then there is a small island which the U.S. wanted as its military base in the Indian Ocean because of global NATO now. NATO is becoming globalized. So suddenly the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean in the narrative has been fused to the Indo-Pacific. Everyone calls it the Indo-Pacific, whereas earlier it was clearly Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. As it is, the, the U.S. has a base in another island called Diego Garcia. Uh, so they, they're bu building new bases in the island. And this island is owned by Bangladesh. It's near its, its coastline. So she said no. So uh, the U.S. Ha has, a, a, you know, no reason to have supported her. And they were looking for an opportunity and this opportunity came uh, because um, uh, there's one more thing, factor which has worked in all these South Asian countries, and that is these neoliberal reforms forced on them because all these small states, whether it is Sri Lanka, Pakistan, which we already talked about, and Bangladesh. They had to adopt neoliberal policies of austerity, of huge privatization, which means they become very unequal. Uh, while Bangladesh, for example, was able to lift a lot of people from poverty, there was also inequality where, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, rich Bangladeshis who were controlling these huge uh, textile factories, the export zones, uh, and they were linked to uh, the, the state, to the regime. Uh, so there was anger against that also, you know, when other people and with this social media and and Bangladesh is not like Pakistan in, in many ways. Number one, it doesn't primarily have uh, Islamic identity. It has a very Bengali identity. Uh, and its military for so for for the last uh, twenty four years has been in the barracks. But um, when this student movement started, and the student movement was all about jobs and the quota system of reservations, because people are desperate for government jobs. It was a huge movement. It was genuinely a revolutionary movement. They they wanted a new social contract, a new political contract. They wanted uh, the right to dissent. Uh, then um, the prime minister and this government clamped down very hard. But I feel it could have been a negotiated settlement uh, where uh, she could have promised jobs. She, of course, it was the Supreme Court of Bangladesh which had um, um, brought back the, the quotas which these uh, people didn't want. There were special quotas for children of freedom fighters. Yeah, were, I think. Yeah, I think we yeah. need to explain that if for in order to get a government job, you had government jobs reserved, like thirty percent for this 30%. group, thirty percent for that group, and right. this was a is a rigid system that that uh, benefits especially the the elites of the former revolution, right? And that's something right. that these young people don't like. Yeah. 
So the quota, for, uh, the, they have a quota system. There is a quota for, uh, you know, the uh, poorest, uh, some specific uh, communities which are socially and economically deprived for generations. The students didn't challenge that. What they challenged was the government for years had a quota for the children of those people who were part of the national liberation movement of Bangladesh in the 70s okay. and had suffered greatly because so many had been killed and raped, etc. So their children and their grandchildren were getting these jobs because there was a 30% quota for them. Uh, they, uh, Sheikh Hasina removed these quotas in between, but the case went to court and uh, the court reinstated it in a lesser amount, but these students did not want this quota. They wanted it removed completely. So they asked for that and she didn't agree and she delayed and she said the case is in court and let's wait. So, uh, it broke down the, the, the kind of um, relationship between the students and the unemployed and the younger generation broke down and it's a large generation. Uh, so uh, this movement began and again, she did not um, kind of really engage with them. And what happens with these movements, and I've seen this repeatedly in South Asia, you begin with uh, you know, a, a good re a progressive movement of these students, but it's joined in by all kinds. So the, I'm 100% sure that the cadre of the Jamaat, the cadre of the BNP, the disaffected opposition formed the quiet base of the movement who were, you know, uh, damaging the statues of national leaders and... Uh, uh, creating violence, etc. Though the students held, uh, you know, the leadership, the top leadership, and then she uh, asked the police to fire on them, which they did. Over a hundred students uh, and the leadership and people over in the movement lost their lives. Then Begum Hasina asked the army to intervene, but the army said they would not fire on the students, and they told her to leave. She had to go to exile. So then, then that is how she left and she came to India. But one of the first statements she said was that she would have completely supported the students. She would have sorted out all these issues, but the Americans wanted this base. And so she, uh, and so this uh, regime change. And, and do you think the, the, the U S um, the, the U.S. ambassador to Beng, Bangladesh is, is a quite famous guy as well, at least in, in U.S. foreign policy circles, is Mr. Hass. Uh, yes. Funnily enough, Hass in German actually means hatred. Uh, Richard <laughs> so, Hass. <laughs> Richard yeah. Hass. Um, anyhow, um, uh, side note, like Hass um, um, apparently had a good connection to the military leadership, but you're saying the military leadership in Bangladesh does not does not act did not have a history of intervening in in Bangladesh like national politics so it does have a history it does have a history except since Begum Khalida won the last three elections so the last 24 years they have not intervened but before uh, that not, not Begum Khalida um Sh yeah, Sheikh so Hasina right Sheikh Hasina, she's been in power. She right? won. She won the three because she's you said Begum Khalida. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Sheikh Hasina, right? Yeah. Sheikh Hasina, she won the last three elections. So at that time, the military was in its barracks, but it plays an important role. The other thing is Bangladesh, unlike Pakistan, does not have these continuous conflicts on its borders. Mm. Pakistan needs its its military because it has a, you know, a a, a sometimes a low intensity, but it's at daggerheads with India. It has problems on the Afghanistan with internal dissent. Um, but Bangladesh has sorted out its border issue with India. And the border issue was not a live conflict border issue, but it was a porous border where a lot of migrants would come into uh, India, which India wanted to stop. 
Uh, and India is not very popular now in Bangladesh, despite for two or three reasons. One is because uh, they supported the Hasina government to such an extent. Uh, their intelligence, the Indian intelligence has been pretty active there. Uh, I think giving her information on whatever. Second, because of India's own minority issues, you know, because we have this nationalist ethnic majoritarian government and our home minister has uh, very often blamed Bangladeshi migrants. In fact, there was a time when he, he said they're termites because they creep into India. So this goes goes down badly with uh, in, in Bangladesh and um, uh, uh, with uh, it, Muslims world over. So uh, there is this um, kind of uh, uh, subaltern dislike towards India in Bangladesh for some time. And this also erupted. Uh, so all these uh, issues but, have... Um, but you know, it is, it, if the role of the US was really quite big in this overthrow of Sheikh Hasina, I mean, this is a very... <laughs> the signal that this sends to India, I just wonder about. Now you've had like three states... Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh regime changed to something more US friendly that undermines the India Indian friendly previous governments or like the governments that were more at least at least closer to India. And doesn't this send also the message that uh, and dear uh, Mr. Moody, if you don't play ball, you're going to be next. Um, this is this is good. But, well, how do you interpret this from the from the viewpoint of India? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, India is uh, got a pretty good lesson this time because they were really the Indian strategic community, especially parts of it, uh, wanted closer and closer relations with the US. And that's got a bit of a hit for sure. But this part of the strategic community also is has a China phobia. So um, uh, so they believe they should balance. The only way they can balance with China is having, you know, closer linkages with, with the U.S. <laughs> the, I wonder, but even they must understand that there is this huge danger of, you know, becoming a staging ground for a U.S. war with China, even if you have a phobia. And maybe here we can make the link to the to Europe because. One big difference, I believe, between South Asia, the game in South Asia and, and the game in Europe is that Europe has not only institutionally been completely captured by the US, but also ideologically. I mean, the, the proxy war in Ukraine is the epitome, like the pinnacle of US, uh, to me, of, of the US power, hard and soft, to enlist an entire other nation to fight a war that it thinks is good for, for its strategic planning, right? And it works like a charm. I mean, people run around with Ukraine flags and saying that we need to fight the evil Russians and they they don't see the whole the whole NATO Russia game, or they think that this is Russian disinformation, and they even manage to enlist uh, F F F Finland and Sweden to play along, not because they were regime changed, but because they the governments which had already been preparing integration then had suddenly the, the political majority to flip because they want it. They want it. A majority of people want that integration. Now in South Asia, it seems to me that the political uh, the political environment and the ideological environment is a different one. So the US, uh, there's way more elements of uh, traditional neo-colonial um, um, power exercise of power which is the um, neoliberal debt trap and then you know if you if all of the big companies in Bangladesh Pakistan and Sri Lanka are US controlled and US money controlled then you get a lot of leverage and if then also the political process is very US friendly and they allow all of these bases then well military and economically these countries are well under control but the general public might not be. You might still have very strong nationalism, like in Pakistan, that then would not 
be willing to fight a US proxy war. You have very strong Indian nationalism um, to the point where people now talk about an ethno national state, right? Which would not be happy for fighting a war with China in behalf of the United States. Um, so how do you see that this, the, the, the way of trying to exercise control over South Asia, how that is what that is developing? It's more in this traditional sense of neocolonialism, isn't it? Yes, correct. But just see now in Bangladesh, who is a person who has become president? Muhammad Yunus, who is very close to, you know, he, he was with the NGOs. He started the system of microcredit, giving credit to poor Bengal women in uh, Bangladesh with which they could invest and have, you know, a small local kind of income. Yeah, uh, at eighteen percent interest and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, and micro many, micro yeah. debt trap. <laughs> micro debt trap, and and it they went into this debt trap, and um, Sheikh Hasina, the prime minister, put I think something like seventeen cases and imprisoned Yunus for six months, but he was always supported by the U.S. And now, when the opportunity comes, and and he also wrote an article in which was published in the Indian newspaper saying he's very disappointed with India for having supported Sheikh Hasina the way they did and they're making a mistake. Uh, and there he is in power now, you see. Uh, so, so, so in this sense, Bangladesh is the closest thing to one of the new versions of uh, um, US exercise of power of capturing people ideologically, not just right. economically and, and militarily. And the, in the case of Pakistan, for example, the Pakistan people are the most anti-American. Whenever there is any kind of strike or, or movement, they always also shout some anti-American slogans. But the military and the elite is close to uh, the Americans. So there's a contradiction there also. In India, a lot of the elite's children are in America. But... India is very, I think, very, because of this long tradition of years since the Indian independence, first of non-alignment, of being anti-colonial, of having solidarity with the uh, anti-colonial movements, uh, because of their close relationship with Russia, which continues to date, extremely close, and the dependence and what happened in the Bangladesh war in the 70s. Of course, the younger generation is forgetting that. But the strategic autonomy and neutrality and this transactional kind of politics, the neutrality, which is not progressive, but is transactional, I think across the political spectrum, Indians are committed to that. Our foreign minister recently said India does not have a NATO mentality. Uh, the uh, American ambassador uh, clearly said over here, that um, there's no such thing as neutrality during war, during conflict. And um, it's, uh, it's, he used words like, maybe he said it's uh, shameful or whatever for this kind of neutrality. Yeah. And many American, very high placed uh, officials from the State Department and European uh, leaders have come and tried to tell India that they cannot be neutral. They should not. There are benefits for them to uh, be with them on Ukraine, but India has not shifted. So the, that's how these, it is. These people are either idiots or more likely just, uh, uh, you know, part of the warmongering, uh, trying to whip the neutrals into place, which is a very traditional thing to do because neutrality only exists during war and conflict. It, it makes no sense outside of war and conflict. So it's only then when it happens. And it's usually the countries that want to have their own position. And uh, your foreign minister uh, um, has said so many, many times. He yes. keeps explaining this. We are neither with the Russians nor with you. We have just our own position. He once in, in an interview said beautifully, you know, uh, I represent 1.2 billion people on this earth i think i have the right to have my own my own position <laughs> i think i earned that <laughs> yes. the fact of what what we represent so um in terms of what you know and what we learn from the southeast asian case if you could speak to georgia which is a small 
Caucasus nation, which is in a similar position over there between the giants, right? The European Union on the one hand, Russia in, in, in the north, with whom they have still, uh, Russia still occupies two of their territories. They don't have diplomatic relations, but they do not, at least the current government, the, the Georgian Dream Party, do, does not want to be a second Ukraine. Now, they have elections in two, in, in two months. They've had unrest in the past. They've seen these, um, these tactics also of the, of the US and so on. If you take the lessons from South Asia and, and speak to Georgia, um, what would you st say that the Georgian uh, people need to be careful of when they, when, when they think about national politics and how it interlinks with their international uh, interventions from outside? I think, I mean, I feel completely shocked that states like uh, Georgia or Moldova, even after they've seen what happens to Ukraine and what has happened to Ukraine, would still want to uh, try and join NATO or the European Union because, and the other thing is, how do they think that American national interest is their national interest? It's in America's national interest to weaken Russia. They say it in document after document. It is in their interest to have, uh, to keep China down. And for that, they need these. And so America is actually a parasitic power. It uses these states for its own agenda. So why do they want to, you know, they've been okay so far. Yes, Abkhazia and Ossetia, uh, you know, they wanted secession. They wanted to, these two provinces in Georgia, they wanted to be part because it was divided. North and South Ossetia, after the Soviet disintegration, half of it got left in Georgia and similarly with Abkhazia. So they wanted more to be with their own identity grouping than with Russia. It just so happened that North Ossetia was with Russia and as was half of Abkhazia. So there was these secessionist movements and the Georgians, you know, they're not very pro-Russian. Uh, they, they see themselves as Europeans, but so do the, the Russians see themselves, you know, as, as Europeans. But there is this geopolitics. And now uh, this is this is this could be a new front if the polarization in Georgia increases. Uh, then you would have a lot of American money coming into the NGOs, into uh, these movements, which uh, say that there's not enough democracy, that um, uh, it's better to join the European Union and that whole narrative, which would be gradually, and the Americans have, you know, they do it over time. They would build leaders, uh, and uh, this uh, possibility of a new front um, sadly can begin. But remember also that Russia said they had two red lines. One was Ukraine, the second was Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, because... and Georgia had its war. And, you know, Georgia stepped back from the brink in 2008. The Saakashvili government was extremely yeah. pro-NATO uh, and, mm -hmm. and pro-integration with the EU. But he got swept out at the Georgian Dream Party, which has about, you know, somewhere roughly 40 percent uh, support in the in the population and is able to to have the biggest say in in uh, who forms the government. Right. The um, they stepped away from that and they are accused by the West, especially in popular media. It was really dumb uh, recently that they are being accused of being pro-Russian. They love Putin, you know, when they did not build they don't have diplomatic relations with Russia, right? It's a dumb narrative. And a Georgian colleague, uh, Lasha Kazaratse, once said, nobody has to teach the Georgians how to not like the Russians. <laughs> we know, they, he, they, he said. Yeah. But um, the narrative is such, because what, what the goal is, of course, from the US side and NATO side of view, is to install an, uh, a friendly regime that then opens Georgia's uh, military capacity and uh, and then again, does the same and aspires NATO membership. But we, this, this then will force Russia to divert military uh, capabilities to the south, uh, which in their sick mindset is a good thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but so in this sense, maybe Georgia is the is most like Pakistan because of these border disputes, right? And these yeah. fluid, these fluid yeah. also identities. Yeah. So Georgia should learn from the Pakistani um, experience. And from the South Asian experience and from the Asian experience. Look, we're not part of NATO. Have ha, have we suffered? Uh, we, we don't want to be part of NATO. We, we uh, 
want to be neutral. We want to ex be able to exercise strategic autonomy. And with this, it helps development. I must tell the Georgians this, that when a country needs development, when it needs stability, it should not over-securitize. Security is not an issue. Russia is not going to intervene in, in you, and nor is NATO if you keep them both out, just like Yugoslavia did for so many years uh, through uh, the Cold War. Uh, and and you will gain because you can get your oil and gas and other resources from Russia and you can get assistance from the West also because they don't want to, they'll keep trying to, uh, you know, come into their spider's web, but you can maintain a strategic autonomy. Uh, you don't have to be part of it. And that is what all the countries in the global South, you can make an index and see those countries in the global South who've had this autonomy and have been have stayed away from either the Cold War or the Hot Wars, they are the countries which have become the emerging countries, the, the Asian tigers. They are the ones whose economies have developed. They are the ones, of course, they've spent a lot on their military, more than they should have. But whether it's uh, India or whether it was Bangladesh all these years, in these golden years, as they call it, of Hasina, uh, or Indonesia or Malaysia, um, or even Vietnam after the war, the reason they have developed is precisely this. They have kept out of great power politics. None of them now at this stage, for example, for Asia, it's now what is relevant is the fact of the uh, global NATO and the fact that the Americans need these bases for China. Even those countries and a large number of countries have some territorial or maritime disputes with China. Look at that. India does. Uh, the islands, some of the islands in Vietnam are disputed. Of course, in the Philippines, they're disputed. Uh, and um, all of uh, uh, this region. But still, they don't want to be allies of the U.S. with military bases. They said we would, we have the strength to negotiate with China on our own. And India, for example, has had 31 dialogues in this joint working uh, mechanism coordination and consulting mechanism between army con commanders of how to manage the border. And the last one just finished two days ago. And they said that the differences have narrowed. So what I'm arguing is that it is good to negotiate. It's good to use your diplomacy. And it's not good to completely ally with any one of these warring countries. One, you can have competition, but you can easily leverage your advantages to balance with both. And that is what I'm advocating for Georgia. In South Asia, the region which has suffered the most and is the poorest now after having resources is Pakistan, precisely because the US has used them ruthlessly. Uh, you know, And now I think maybe they might even, except for using them militarily, they might want to drop them because it's so unstable. They would rather, you know, their idea might be, the, and they balance India with Pakistan. They would have preferred to have India as their base, but India is not going to give them any military bases. They do have a logistic agreement where they can use some ports. But beyond that, and they're a part of Quad, and the reason uh, why Quad is not taking off is because India wants it to be, you know, about safety, about um, uh safe maritime lines but they don't want to be an anti-china front they have a lot of platforms where they are working with china like the BRICS and uh, the shanghai cooperation organization uh, and they have very similar views on on multipolarity uh, on climate change etc so that's yeah. what i would advocate to georgia yeah it's quite simple Cooperate with everybody and don't make yourself the staging ground for anyone's military. Stay out of that one. Um, I think these are these are these are wonderful lessons. These are wonderful case studies in South Asia, and I do hope that our Georgian friends are uh, watching and listening and and can draw parallels. Um, what's good for your country is probably not the same as what it is for others. So do your thing. Uh, Anu Chenoy, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Pascal. Keep at it.